Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Good Stuff. This is the AAS author series uh, on AAS YouTube, uh, where we talk about um, recent and impactful and or impactful um, AAS publications. And I am super happy to have Cole Miller with us today. Hey, Cole. Hey, Frank. Good to see you, everyone. Good. Where are you at? I am at the University of Maryland. I am a professor of astronomy here which I have been since 99, which means I tell my students I've been a professor for two millennia. <laughs> and uh, right now I'm a little bit more limited in my travels than I would be uh, otherwise. Yeah. But at least there is a very nice park nearby where I get to walk around with my wife, who is also a scientist, so that we can think about leaves and birds and not just black holes and neutron stars. Excellent, excellent. So I take it that's what you primarily like to do research on is uh, compact objects? Yeah, black holes, neutron stars, gravitational waves are of great interest and very current. Mm. Of course. Mm. Yes, especially in the, it'd be quite interesting to see what happens with O3 coming up here uh, yeah. on that data pipe coming out. So um, very cool. So speaking of your research interests, why don't we get right into it? And we are going to talk about this lovely paper on PSR J0030 plus 0451 mass and radius from nicer data and implications for the properties of neutron star matter. Cole, take it away. Yes, thank you very much. This was the culmination of a lot of work within the NICER team. Now NICER is a NASA mission. It stands for Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer. It's on the International Space Station and it has done a lot of work. You've probably seen this on the archive and in the APJ and associated journals a lot. However, the number one thing, the main goal that it had was to measure not just the mass, but also the radius of several neutron stars with both precision and accuracy. And I led one of the groups and Tom Riley of the University of Amsterdam led the other. Okay. And the thing that is wonderful about this is that although the analyses were done independently with different sequences of models, different approaches to calibration, whatever. Uh -huh. Not only the mass and radius that we got independently, but even the patterns of hot emission of x-rays on the surfaces agree with each other. So this is a very positive thing. Cool. To give you a little bit of context, the matter inside neutron stars is unlike anything that we can explore in laboratories on Earth. One way in which it's different is that it's denser than matter can be on Earth. It's probably up to a few times as dense as an atomic nucleus. Mm -hmm. It's also cold in the sense of astronomy where you always have to say compared to what? Yeah, right. In this case, it's cold compared to the Fermi temperature. Okay. Meaning that even though in an absolute sense it could be 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9 degrees Kelvin, which is hotter than I personally like it, it's still much colder than the 10 to the 12 Kelvin Fermi temperature. Yes. But one other thing that's important, and this is a substantial extrapolation compared to what you can get in the lab, is that it's very neutron rich, as you might expect from these things being called neutron stars. One consequence of this, and the fact that there is no straightforward way of going from quantum chromodynamics to very first principles theories of nuclear physics uh -huh. is that we have a lot of disagreement in models between what the properties of the matter should be. Composition is a big thing. Is it mainly neutrons with a few protons, electrons, and muons? Is it hyperons? Is it free quarks? Now that's not exactly what we can get when we're looking at neutron stars. Right. We're looking at bulk properties, the highest mass achievable, or the radius is a function of mass. And this has to do with what is called the equation of state. Mm -hmm. And the equation of state for a neutron star is the pressure as a function of a quantity such as the total energy density. Because it's cold, the temperature doesn't matter. And this is thought to be so-called catalyzed matter, meaning that it's in the energetic ground state at a given energy density. Okay. And if so, then it's just pressure as a function of energy density. This is what affects the measurables, such as the mass and the radius, the tidal deformability, which we're familiar with from gravitational waves. Uh -huh. And it's been known for a long time that if you can measure the radius with great precision and accuracy, this is going to be extremely informative. And indeed, over the past 10 to 15 years, there have been many papers. Many. 
<laughs> done analysis of x-ray data and occasionally other things to try to get at the radius in particular. Mm -hmm. The challenge though is that the methods that existed prior to NICER taking its data tended to be at least very susceptible to large systematic errors, meaning that it's possible and this happens that you can get very statistically good fits. There's no indication of a problem. And right. yet you can be very, very problematically off in terms of a bias. Right. Yep. So how does NICER, uh, how does NICER help with that? NICER helps with that because previous methods largely were looking just at spectra. And it may help a little bit to give some context here and as an example. Let's suppose that we wanted to measure the radius of a star like the sun. Okay. Most of the stars are too far from us to get any kind of angular resolution. But we can say, oh, the spectrum looks like a black body, figure out the distance by parallax maybe, get the flux, you measure the spectrum, get the peak, you know the temperature, apply the formula, get the radius, it's all good. And if you do that with something like the sun itself or a few other stars where we have independent measures of the radius, you do pretty well. Do the same thing with neutron stars and you get ridiculous answers like two kilometers or five kilometers. But the answer for a realistic neutron star is more like 10 to 14 kilometers. Yes. And this is kind of an issue. It, it's been clear that there are many uncertainties and it's not possible to break the degeneracy very easily. However, work that was done prior to NICER by a number of people, including my colleagues and myself, suggested that because NICER is not just measuring a spectrum, it's looking at a large accumulation of data over millions of seconds. Okay. You also, you have an energy dependent waveform. You have a, therefore a phase component as well as the spectral component. Okay. And it appears from a lot of studies that we've done that when you do this, if you do get a statistically reasonable fit, then you are not in fact going to be significantly biased. So this was part of the hope going into the mission. Okay. Well, NICER has a lot of excellent properties to it. It has spectacularly good timing in the tens of nanoseconds per X-ray count. Uh, it has good enough spectral resolution. And because of the nature of the mission, focusing on these particular objects, it has allowed us to look very carefully at a selected set of pulsars. Of these, the first that we decided to announce in terms of the analysis was this PSR J0030 plus 0451. This is, of course, one of the disadvantages of being in a, a branch of astronomy that started comparatively late, is that we don't have a lot of individual warm fuzzy names like <laughs> and Jupiter and whatever. In, instead we have phone numbers but that's what we live with. This is an isolated pulsar. Okay. This poses an extra challenge because if it were a binary and there are others in the list that are binaries we would have at least the prospect of an independent measure of the mass right. just by standard orbital modulation. We don't have that here, but it has other properties. For example, it does not appear to have any significant systematic issues that we can discern. And that has caused us to focus on this. If we're thinking about what we want to do, we're thinking about having models of the surface emission. One nice aspect about this is that the X-rays, which are thought to be produced in this non-accreting pulsar, Okay. by a mechanism which is also producing the radio pulses that we see. You essentially have a large electric potential. You're accelerating electrons and positrons and creating cascades and whatever. And if they're going along the field line, they have to hit the other side. And so they deposit energy there. And that deposition of energy bubbles up as thermal x-rays. We therefore have to think, what are the regions where we primarily have the emission looking like? Obviously, it's necessary to make certain simplifications. You want to choose the simplest explanation that works, but no simpler is a classic quote. And so we looked at a variety of possibilities and settled ultimately on two general models. Okay. One of them 
has two oval shapes, which could overlap in a variety of ways. And these oval shapes, they both emit uniformly, but they could be different effective temperatures. They could be arbitrary locations. They could overlap or not. Okay. And the second is three ovals. Again, arbitrary overlap, position, size, aspect ratio, and, and that. Now, if we can... So what leads, what leads one to an oval solution as opposed to a uniform temperature solution? Yeah, good question. If you think about the, the process of going through the modeling, one of the things that we note is that there is a certain harmonic structure. Okay. Meaning that you can look at the fundamental, which is at the pulsar frequency. You yep. can look at the first overtone at double that and triple and so on. And the structure suggests at least moderately broad spots in an azimuthal sense. But the other thing we have is we can look at the overall amount of modulated counts. Okay. And that suggests a comparatively small spot at the known distance. And it turned out that if we use just circular spots, it didn't work. It was not able to solve both of these. However, by putting in an oval spot, we can get the harmonic structure and the appropriate number of modulated counts. Okay. What we have up on the screen currently is a good representation of our best fits for on the top, the two oval solution and the bottom, the three oval solution. And the top, the, and, and the bottom as well, the horizontal bar on this equal area projection represents the co-latitude of the observer. Uh, okay. 70 or so degrees. Uh -huh. On the left-hand side, as I say, is the equatorial equal area projection. On the right-hand side is a projection as we're looking from the South Pole, where we define the North Pole as the hemisphere we're in rotationally. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you can see in the bottom, we have the three oval fit, where the Red and yellow ovals, representing the first two, are very similar to what we had before. And the blue oval is somewhat offset, and it's a, a little bit offset of the south rotational pole, also a bit higher temperature. You can see that spot. It, it makes a bit of a difference. These are comparable fits in the Bayesian evidence sense, meaning that we cannot really prefer one over the other, but we ended up featuring the three-spot fit because it's slightly greater evidence, although not in a statistically significant way. And also because we want to be able to break people away from the classic textbook image they have of always having two spots on a neutron star. And okay. millisecond pulsars like this one, this has a rotational frequency of 205 hertz. Millisecond pulsars have gone through all sorts of weird spin evolution, and they could well have had their magnetic distribution be changed as well. So do you, uh, given that, uh, do you have any comments on why all the spots are in the southern, southern regions? Well, one of the people on NICER was suggesting they might be social distancing from us. <laughs> but I, I would prefer a less anthropomorphic explanation here. Please. <laughs> Essentially that there's no special reason why they have to be in the same rotational hemisphere. Fair enough. Due to the spin evolution. If all of the pulsars we eventually examine with NICER are also in the opposite rotational hemisphere, okay. well, then we might start to be personally offended. <laughs> okay. But in the meantime, this is something that certainly can happen. And for example, if you look at the magnetic fields of Uranus or Neptune, they're far from being center dipoles. Sure, and right. Here we're getting really the first close look at the distribution on a neutron star. And why not, I suppose? It's, a simple it's the Uranus answer. of millisecond pulsars. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> if we good. look at these two models, we find, fortunately, that the implications are very similar for both. Okay. If we go to figure six, which has the one-dimensional posteriors, and we'll look at, have different looks at this. We'll get there, page six. <clears throat> so page 19? Yes. All right, so looking at this, 
we have on the top the results from the two oval fit and the bottom the three oval fit. By mm -hmm. eye, you can quite easily tell that they're very similar to each other. Um, the left-hand panels are the mass posterior, the middle is the right, uh, the uh, radius, and then the right-hand one is the distance, where the, the dotted line is the prior based on previous measurements of the distance to this particular pulsar. And this was actually important because what we were discovering early on is that if we used the energy channels all the way down to the lowest available, there were systematics that tended to push the inferred distance to a value that was considerably higher than it actually was. And we did a, a bunch of testing on that. It mm -hmm. informed our choice of the energy channels to use. But looking at this, we see the, the prior and the posterior. And what it tells us is that the nicer data by themselves are not really telling us a lot about the distance because the posterior is basically the same as the prior. Right. Well, better than having it shoved over to one side or another. So these are very similar to each other. Right. And another look at that is on the next page in figure seven, where we are examining the mass radius posteriors and the, have the contours are the 68% and the 95.4%, meaning roughly the one and two sigma. Right. Left hand is the two panel, the two oval, and then the right hand is the three oval. Again, these are very similar to each other, and this is good. Uh, one of the things we have to check, uh, especially based on previous experience in this field, is if we make somewhat different assumptions, if we model this somewhat differently, are we, in fact, running into very different inferences? And luckily, we're not. This is a, something that is, is good. It makes us feel warm and fuzzy. Uh, okay. Given that, uh, why not go to a four-spot model, a five-spot model? Yeah, and the reason for that comes down to the bit about making your model as simple as you can, but not simpler, or in the Bayesian sense, you want to have something that maximizes the evidence. And if you add extra spots with the parameters that come along with them, you find that you do not improve the fit in any significant way, and therefore, you are violating poor William of Ockham's ideas. And that's the reason that we don't go to more. We, all, we did try things like four circular spot fits. Mm -hmm. The other thing from a practical standpoint, which makes us a bit relieved that we did not have to go to more spots, is that it becomes tougher and tougher to do representative sampling. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. No. Pretty good. Another visual here. Two pages later, figure nine. Let me ask one question on figure seven. Okay. Uh, so the color bar is a credibility, so I would assume zero means no credibility whatsoever. <laughs> well, is yeah. that correct? Uh, not uh, so. Not a, not exactly. Uh, okay. zero, zero means basically peak credibility. Then okay, far, so. you're moving far and farther and farther away from that. So yes, I, I do understand that you would think that higher values of credibility mean you believe it. Something good. <laughs> but this is, is not actually what is intended here. Okay, one minus, uh, in my head, one minus credibility. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. No problem. Uh, where do you want to go next? Two pages later, I guess. Figure. Uh, oh, sorry, one page later, right there. Yeah, figure nine. Oh, that's a, uh, looks like my television, or used to look like my television. Yeah, no doubt about it. You look at this and you say, this is a test pattern of some sort. And here's just an example of something we also do more extensively in other parts of the paper. I, first, I, I wish to tell you that I am very much a committed Bayesian. I believe that Bayesian statistics is the morally correct way to approach issues of inference. However, I am not a fundamentalist Bayesian. And one thing that Bayesian statistics lacks is an easy way of determining whether something is a good fit. A truly fundamentalist Bayesian will, will argue that this is a good thing. There's no such thing as a good fit in a vacuum. It has to be compared to something else. There's something to be said for that. However, in this particular case, 
what we wanted to do is to determine using plain old chi squared okay. whether the fit we had seemed adequate. If we ended up with a chi square per degree of freedom of 10 with some thousands of pulse phase slash energy channel bins, mm -hmm. that would tell us that we were clearly missing something in our fit. So this is kind of a one-way test. Mm -hmm. If it's a miserable fit by chi-square, we're definitely missing something. If it appears to be good, we cannot conclude it's the right answer, but at least we have checked something off of our list. Yes. And so this test pattern that you're looking at is, is what shows uh, when we have as you see on the horizontal axis, the phase bin, we used 32. And the energy channel, starting at 40 and going up to a bit over 200. And on the right hand, you can see the grayscale bar, and this is chi, so this is the sine square root of chi squared, meaning it tells you whether it's above or below. There are no obvious patterns. The overall chi square per degree of freedom is perfectly fine. This is what it should look like. So this is a boring plot, and we're happy about that. Uh, the chi-square bar is linear? Yes, the chi bar is linear, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And we have okay. pretty much as many things above one sigma, two sigma, three sigma, as you would expect if we had a perfect model and we're drawing using Poisson draws. Got it. Okay, I'm with you. Cool. Good. So necessary but not sufficient. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that really, that's the way we have to look at it. <clears throat> we can't ever say chi-square is good, therefore we have the right answer. We cannot do that. No. We can't say chi-square is terrible, so something is bad. Right. Okay. Now, the next thing I, I want to do, <clears throat> emphasize here has to do with yet another one of the checks that we have to do. We're always being very, very aware of potential systematic error. And one thing that we're doing in all of this is we're using a an approach, a model, that was developed by Sharon Morsink of the University of Alberta and her collaborators, and she is on this paper as well. Okay. And that is when we're effectively saying we have x-ray hot spots on the star and we're doing ray tracing from that to us, the observer. This is something which we need to use a model that is fast, but also accurate. She developed something that we have called the oblate Schwarzschild model, meaning that if you rotate the star, it becomes oblate, mm -hmm. but you treat the exterior space-time as Schwarzschild, non-rotating, which may seem like a contradiction because you'd think, gosh, if you've got some rotation, you clearly have a frame dragging that's involved. Right. However, this is a case where order counting actually misleads you a lot. And I say that because Frame dragging occurs to first order in rotation. Oblateness happens to second order in rotation. If you yeah. do order counting, you're thinking to yourself, well, clearly the first important effect is going to be frame dragging, not oblateness. But this is not true, right. not by a long shot, in fact. The coefficient matters a lot. And also, in the same way that if you have, say, a black hole and you rotate it, the lowest order thing that happens is the image shifts rather than distorting in its apparent shape, the actual effect that matters to us may well be second order here. A lot of study has been done, and so that's not a problem. Schwarzschild exterior space-time is good. But now you start to worry. What about the actual radius that you're talking about? What radius is that we want? If we're comparing, say, doing an analysis using the tolman oppenheimer volkoff equation, which right. is hydrostatic equilibrium, in GR for a non-rotating star, but we're somehow treating these objects as rotating and oblate, is there a, a significant inconsistency? Right. So if we could look at figure 13. Okay. Figure 13. On the right. Uh -huh. Something that Sharon produced. And what we see here is the gravitational mass versus the equatorial circumferential radius for four different representative equations of state at zero hertz with a dotted line and at 200 hertz, which is roughly the frequency of our star, in the solid lines. Uh, okay. And Got it. 
as you can see, there's a difference. And as you would expect at lower masses, when the things are a bit bulkier, there's a greater difference. But we can only dream of having a precision of measurement, yep. which is such that the difference matters. And so this is kind of an indication that our approximation is good. Right. It's basically the difference between rotating and non-rotating. Exactly. And we can treat this as we're solving the TOV equation as if it's non-rotating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, right. Right. Then the payoff figure, which is figure 14 on the next page. A money plot. Yeah, the money plot. Figure 14. Let's blow that up then. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. Let me try to walk through this carefully. Remembering that the most interesting thing that we want to get out of this analysis is new insight about the properties of the very dense matter inside neutron stars. Not the composition, which we can't tell directly, but things like the pressure versus the density. Right. This measurement that we have made and that Tom Riley and his colleagues have made, again, complete consistency between the two, <clears throat> gives us new information. It adds to things like the high measured masses of a few pulsars, the tidal deformability upper limit seen with the gravitational waves from GW170817. Mm -hmm. And now this is something which is a valuable addition. And there are a lot of details about this and people, if they wish to read our paper, you can see the details we added, but essentially what we're doing is we're saying we have a parameterized equation of state. We're not trying to look at individual proposed equations of state. We just say we know it up to some density and we parameterize it with a few parameters beyond that density. This is a standard approach that is often used. Okay. And to try to go through this just a bit by bit, the top set of panels is for one parameterization, the bottom is for another. If we focus on the top one and also two for the bottom, on the left-hand panel, we show the prior on our equation of state. Ah, okay. Dash dotted lines are the full range of pressure at a given density. The solid lines are the fifth percentile to 95th percentile. And then in the middle panel, okay. the dotted line is that fifth to 95th percentile from the previous one, so the prior, but now adding the information that we have from the measurement of the mass and radius of this neutron star. So that's the highlighted bit. And then on the right-hand side, we add even more information where we are including not just the nicer measurements, but also the gravitational wave measurements, the existence of the high mass pulsars. Okay. What we finally get in the right-hand panel with the solid black lines, the dashed red lines are the fifth to 95th percentile range from the middle panel. So yeah. basically we're increasing information to the right and then showing the blue dashed lines, there are three of them. And these come from a particular paper using chiral effective field theory, okay. where they have different equations of state at different densities. Mm -hmm. And this shows that with everything put together, but even just using the nicer information, we're able to rule in favor of the harder or higher pressure of these equations of state as opposed to the softest one. All right, so the difference between, for example, on that right, on the right, um, right plot, so the difference between the red curve on the top, let's say, the upper, upper yeah. red, and then the upper black um, is informing you a bit about um, how much more you constrain things by adding in the gravitational wave and other data. So not as much as the bounds that you get from NICER, right? It's an improvement. It, it, I think the point is everything needs to be put in. If we were, for example, and we've done this, if we were to look at what we had before NICER and then say, what do we have now that we include NICER, then depending on the density, you can restrict the pressure range by 20 to 30%. And uh, yeah. this, is, this is something that is informative and it's something that is going to improve even more as NICER takes more data on this pulsar and looks at other pulsars. So NICER is still operational, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be operational for at least another couple of years, and we awesome. hope more. 
Awesome. Okay, so we're gonna knock out uh, knock out at least one effective chiral field theory there on the end. It's got a um, on the large pressure side. So yeah, we knock out one of those, <clears throat> and then the other one in the middle is sort of marginal, <laughs> sort of right on the bounds, but okay. Yeah. And this is something that has already been of great use to nuclear physicists who are trying to refine their theories. Cool. Very nice. I'm still expecting a plethora of equation of state papers to be submitted. <laughs> yeah. but they, what All consistent I, with nicer results. What I like to say is that back when I was young and naive a decade ago, uh -huh. I that nuclear physicists always did things very precisely from first principles, but it turns out that there's something called the fermion sign problem, which makes it extremely difficult to do that. Yes. And therefore, they have a lot of phenomenological theories. Yes, yes. And for those who don't know about the, the sign problem, um, Google it. It's interesting. It comes up in a lot of fields uh, on, on why exactly that's, that's an issue. So yeah, check it out, the sign problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is more or less it for this paper, but you might be interested if I were to tell you a little bit more about what's going to be coming up in the future. Yes, please. One thing is that even with this single pulsar, by the end of this calendar year, we expect to have roughly double the amount of data that we analyze to produce this paper. Okay. If things work in a root end sense, and there seems to be reason to believe that, we would expect both the mass and the radius to decrease in their uncertainty by one over root two. Yes. That means that this is going to significantly better constrain things. So that's a big, big plus. However, there are other things as well that we're working on and always trying to be super careful about systematics. There is, for example, the brightest non-accreting X-ray millisecond pulsar. This is JO437. Mm-hmm which as a random trivia bit has the best measured distance of any object outside the solar system. And it's in a binary. So we have the distance very precisely. The binary gives us the mass precisely. It gives us the observer inclination, at least to the orbital axis very precisely. We've worried a little bit about some of the systematics because the data are so good that we do have to think about that very carefully. But that's something that at least has the prospect of giving us an even more precise measurement than we would get with the one that we did analyze. So that's going to be exciting and looking for consistency between the, the radii will be a fun thing to do. Uh, let me ask a question. Does, would, one, um, would one expect nature to produce a single one nuclear equation mistake? Or is nature, there's several channels, there's several avenues, and so maybe there's a spread of nuclear equation state, all valid, and they manifest themselves um, at different masses at different phenomena. Or do you think that there is one true nuclear equation state for all neutron stars? Yeah, this is a very important question. And, and let me actually put a, a bit of a nuance into this. Okay. The likelihood, although not the certainty, which I'll get to in a second, in my opinion, is that there is a single equilibrium pressure versus energy density curve. Okay. But higher mass neutron stars might be able to get to higher central densities. Mm -hmm. And by the way, one of the other pulsars that is being studied by NICER has the highest precisely determined mass of any neutron star. This is the J0740. Yep. That's one thing, is meaning you could, you could even have different states of matter in the centers of different neutron stars, but that could just be related to density. But then the other thing is the argument that is usually made for why there might be one single pressure versus energy density curve is that the energy needed to go over metastable barriers is much larger than the size of the barriers. So that unlike, say, you and I 
are not at nuclear equilibrium. If we were, we'd be nickel 62, but I don't think I am, and I don't believe you are either. But the amount of energy needed to go from our current state to nickel 62 is enormous. We, we simply don't have that kind of access. Okay. 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 But the potential confounding factor is that it is at least conceivable that you could have a state of matter due to some initial conditions of whatever type, which is maybe not the true ground state in that energy density, but perhaps to get to the ground state, it requires extraordinarily improbable weak interactions. Okay. And if you dial things, you can apparently get to hundreds of millions of years. Um, my guess is no. Okay. But of course, if we were to get extremely good evidence that we have different families, different radii at the same mass, uh -huh. then this would have to be explained. And whether it's two uh, genuinely different families or whether you have some uh -huh. phase transition that allows you to jump down in mass at whatever mass it is, could be determined. But uh, we'd have to have pretty good evidence to be confident in that. Got it. Got it. And of course, you said a key word there, equilibrium, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, now, you know, the outer crust of non-equilibrium, um, they're still yeah. in a state of non-equilibrium. Yeah, exactly. The atmosphere of a neutron star is almost certainly not in nuclear equilibrium. It's certainly. maybe it's hydrogen or helium or something. It's, again, it's not iron peak elements. But when you get down to the core of the neutron star, I think the, the most likely situation is that it is in equilibrium. Okay. Cool. Cool. What's... Uh, so you said NICE will go for a few years. Uh, yep. Put on your crystal ball and what do you see post NICER? Is there a NICER 2? Is there another um, mission proposals for um, a better NICER? There are things that people have talked about in the past, like LOFT, but ultimately did not make it far enough in the, in the ESA competition to be able to do that. There are missions like EXTP, okay. that have some polarization information. One of the things okay. about laser, though, it's not, it's not simply a matter that it has outstanding X-ray timing and that it has enough spectral resolution to do the job. It's also the nature of the mission and the focus that the team has had. Mm -hmm. Meaning, as I mentioned, for this particular Pulsar, J0030, it was about 1.8 million seconds on source. Yeah. If you have a large mission, which is supposed to do a lot of things, there's just no way you're going to spend that amount of time in a single source. Right. It's therefore the mission planning, which is really coming in in an important way as well. Therefore, you either, either need something that has vastly larger area and can do 100 kilosecond observations and get similar data, Okay. Well, you need something else that is dedicated and higher area slash more capable in some way. Uh, I hope people are interested. <laughs> yes. The, the cool. fraction of the x-ray community that is deeply interested in x-ray timing is, well, it's a small fraction because there are many other vast, very interesting things in the x-ray skies. My hope is that this piques the interest of enough people that we can start talking seriously about such things. Cool. Cool. So the future is fairly bright, it seems like. So um, people who are interested in talking about uh, NICER and results of this paper, uh, you'll know how to get in touch with Cole. We won't be putting his email address in the YouTube description down below. Um, but if you're in the game, you know how to find him. And Cole, I want to thank you so much for uh, taking some time today and, and talking about your very cool paper. Thanks, Frank. Good to talk with you. All righty. Bye, everyone, and we'll see you on the next one.